This documentary is dedicated to those unsung heroes of 1857, the first war of independence, and the great revolutionaries who followed them to the Andamans, to be incarcerated in the cellular jail, to suffer inhuman and barbaric atrocities for the freedom of their motherland. And those martyrs who made it possible for us to live with our heads high as free citizens of an independent country. independence movement has been a saga of struggle, courage and determination to wrest independence from the British colonial rule. In that long drawn out fight for freedom, many Indians have sacrificed their lives. There is no parallel history to the history of human endurance, history of inhuman cruelties and barbarities on educated youths of India who fought for the emancipation of their country. The history of cellular jail and freedom movement is the history of their brave defiance and passive resistance in the face of unspeakable sufferings. To most Indians of the present day, the memory of the penal settlement of the Andamans is associated with the cellular jail. Within its solitary cells who are confined for years together the revolutionary patriots of India who were engaged in a long, arduous and bitter struggle for freedom since the beginning of the present century. Shortly after the completion of the cellular jail in 1906, the Swadeshi movement in Bengal gradually developed into an all India revolutionary movement against British rule. Many newspapers were started, which played a significant role in rousing the people's interest in revolutionary activities. A group of young men, led by Barindra Kumar Ghosh, younger brother of Sri Aurobindo, had formed the Jugantar party in 1906 and carried their rebellious activities in a garden house in Maniktola in Calcutta, where they were collecting arms and manufacturing bombs. Immediately after the bomb incident on 30th April 1908, in Muzaffarpur in Bihar, the group was arrested and was committed for trial to the court. The gates of the cellular jail were opened and the approval of the government of India for the deportation of term convicts to the Andamans was reduced only to a procedural formality. Since then, the history of Andamans for a period of more than 25 years is practically the history of the revolutionary prisoners from different parts of India, sent there in successive batches with occasional intervals. The first batch of political prisoners convicted in the Manikpola conspiracy case, also called the Alipur bomb case of 1908, sentenced to transportation for life and long terms of imprisonment, were sent to the cellular jail in December 1909. About the same time, in 1910-1911, three more from Bombay were sentenced to transportation for life in the Nasik conspiracy case. These were the two brothers, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar and Ganesh Damodar Savarkar and Vaman Elias Daji. Veer Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, the doyen of the Indian revolutionaries, reached the Andamans on 4th July 1911 and was to be incarcerated in the dreaded cellular jail for 50 years. 
There were a few prisoners who were sent to the Andamans in 1907-8 for seditious writing in newspapers. Some young revolutionaries convicted in Kulna conspiracy case on 30th August 1910 were also sent to Andamans. On their arrival, the first person to meet the political prisoners was the jailer, Mr. David Barry, a terror, a bulldog in appearance, claiming to tame the lions. V.D. Savarkar mentions about the first despotic address of Barry, who said, Listen, ye prisoners. In the universe there is one God, and he lives in the heaven above. But in Port Blair there are two. One, the God in heaven, and another, the God of earth. Indeed, the God of earth in Port Blair, that is, myself. The God of heaven will reward you when you go above, but the God of Port Blair will reward you here and now. Incarcerated in the Andaman jail, the political prisoners were totally cut off from the outside world. To the British, cellular jail was an impressive symbol of imperial stability. They were confident that once the prison was established, properly run and administered, there would be no trouble. But the trouble persisted. Seven wings radiating from the central watchtower, a degree of privacy and dignity unheard, a whole room for just one occupant could be said to verge on the luxurious. But the prisoners were miserable in solitary confinement. The construction of the cellular jail, which was started in October 1896, was completed in 1906. Built on the seacoast at Atlanta Point in Aberdeen, at a height of 60 feet from sea level. The jail was quite unusual in its structure. It had iron gates at the main entrance. On the main entrance was the administrative block. On entering the main gate was a high-roofed corridor. And then there was a small courtyard on the right-hand side. From here, the elevation of the jail building was visible and it gave a weird look of a place with no exit gate. Adjoining the wing number seven was the gallows. Barindra Kumar Ghosh of Alipur bomb case has given a vivid description of the structure of the cellular jail in his book, The Tale of My Exile. This jail had seven wings, each departing towards different directions from a central tower, and each wing had three stories, the central tower, representing three-storied pillar or minaret, had the fourth story also, probably to facilitate the watch and ward. Since each wing was like the spokes of a wheel, and central tower part like a fulcrum, the egress and ingress from each wing and each story to another was possible through the central part, known as the control tower. A guard was posted on each of the three stories in the central fulcrum. All he had to do was to walk round to get a clear, complete and unobstructed view of the veranda which faced the cells on each floor of each wing. One convict warder used to be on night duty in each wing and on each floor. Therefore, at a time, there used to be 21 warders on duty on three floors and seven wings of the jail. Their duty changed after every three hours, and therefore, 84 convict warders remained on duty each night. The cellular jail had 690 cells. The jail had no barracks or dormitories. The size of each cell was 13 and a half feet by seven feet. One ventilator of the size three feet by one and a half feet was provided in the back wall of each cell at a height of nearly 10 feet from the floor of the cell. It had a slanting shade outside. One could hardly see the outside world, even through the ventilator. 
Each cell had a door made of iron bars with an opening into the veranda. The doors of the cell were shut by means of iron bolts and locks from outside, and their location was such that they could not be opened by the inmates from within. Of furniture in the room, there was a low bedstead, one and a half feet wide, and in one corner, an earthen pot painted with tar, a most marvellous invention to produce equanimity of soul with regard to smell, was provided to answer the call of nature at night. The cells in the jail were in a row. The veranda, about four feet wide, ran all along the front of the cells. On the opposite side of the cells, Iron railings were fixed into the arched pillars that supported the roof of the veranda. In order to minimize the chances of dialogue among the prisoners and to isolate them from each other, the construction of the jail was so made that the front portion of each wing was to face the back of the other. The revolutionaries in cellular jail were not treated as political prisoners, but they were called as seditionists or anarchists and were treated worse than ordinary criminals. They were given to wear the Class D that signified dangerous or PI, permanently incarcerated badge. There were rules and regulations for assignment of work to the prisoners, but the political prisoners were treated differently. They were forced to do hard labor under the well-determined plan. Abuses and humiliations were hurled upon them intentionally to reduce them to mental and physical wrecks. जब हम 33 में आए, उस समय हमें कुछ सुविधाएं मिल गई थीं, लेकिन सन 33 से पहले और सन 77 से लेकर के जब इतिहास देखते हैं, तो हम देखते हैं कि सैकड़ों नौजवान और देश वक्त यहाँ पर मर गए। अगर दुनिया में कहीं नरक था, तो हम उसको अनुमान कर सकते हैं, कर सकते हैं। यहाँ कोई कानून नहीं, नियम नहीं, उन्हें दो कमनल भेज दियो मार मार के कैदी को यहीं पर कोठी में जान से मार दिया सन 15 में जो लोग आए उसमें डेढ़ सौ कैदी उन्होंने काम तुम्हारा कानून नहीं मानते तो उन्होंने डेढ़ साल तक ये टाट पहरा और लपसी यानी वो आटे का घोल खाया इस तरह ये वो संघर्ष करते रहे were some of the severest tasks to which they were employed. The beating of dry and hard remains of coconut shells day long and every day caused palm swelling and injuries in the palm. Each one was given dry husk of 20 coconuts. The husk had first to be placed on a piece of wood, then to be beaten with a wooden mallet till it became soft. Then the outer skin had to be removed. By sheer pounding, all the husk inside dropped off only the fibers remaining. Each one was expected to prepare daily a roll of such fibers weighing one sail. Rope making, technically called picking oakum, was also a difficult task. Each prisoner had to turn out three pounds weight of rope. The oil grinding was the hardest task of all. There were two processes of working the oil grinding mill in the cellular jail. One was the political prisoners were yoked to the handle of the mill and forced to move round it continuously. In the other process, the handle was moved by the hand of the prisoner who had to run round and round the mill. In both cases, the prisoners must work until specified quantity was produced. Savarkar writes, They were determined to break our spirit and to demoralize us. So they gave us hard work to do for two months continuously. Then one month, on picking oakum, Again, the grinding work on the mill. Hardly out of bed, we were ordered to wear a strip of cloth and made to turn the wheel of the oil mill. Ordinarily, all work had to be stopped between 10 and 12. But this kolu, as the oil mill labor was called, had to continue throughout. If on any day, none of them could finish the quota allotted to them for the day, none would get anything to eat till he had finished his quota, continuing the work without rest until five o'clock in the evening and the mill creaked on till 8 or 9 p.m. If the prisoners were unable to finish the quota of work allotted to them, they were handcuffed for a week. 
The next punishment was chain fetters, bar fetters, or crossbar fetters for days, weeks, or even months to confinement and solitary cells. Their torture knew no bounds. With hands cuffed above and feet trapped in the base, flogging was frequently resorted to on iron triangular frame. Wearing of jute cloth as punishment dress was another prescribed penalty. Each prisoner was given an iron plate and an iron dish, red with rust and smeared with oil. These could not be cleaned at all. The quality and quantity of food given to political prisoners can well be judged by seeing the plate on which food was served to them. The convicts were provided a half pant, a kurta and a cap. But he was not provided with any change for taking bath, except a langoti, which hardly covered his nudity. Political prisoners were not admitted to the hospital. The doctor declared him sick only when he was in his death's bed. One prisoner who outwitted the jail authority by his passive resistance to work at the oil mill was Nanda Gopal, editor of the Swaraj of Allahabad. It was this attitude of his that led to the first strike of the political prisoners in the cellular jail, although it hardly lasted for about three months. All forms of punishment were tried on the strikers. But they did not swerve. They held out against all odds. The authorities relented and assured them work outside the jail with no work on the oil mill. It was the first major victory of the political prisoners in the whole epic struggle. Martyr Indu Bhushan Roy was the first political prisoner to put an end to his life in the early morning of 29th April 1912 by hanging himself in his cell as a mark of protest against a brutal torture and inhuman treatment towards the prisoners. The case of Ullas Kardatta of the Manik Tola conspiracy case is just an example to indicate the extent of unlimited barbarism and brutality of punishment inflicted on the political prisoners. He was handcuffed and tied up and charged with electric battery shock. He remained in a state of unconsciousness for three days and nights. He was shifted to the hospital, but he had gone stark mad. He was removed to mental hospital and after a short period, he was removed to a lunatic asylum in Madras. Savarkar wrote, heart-rending cries one after another had filled the whole atmosphere. I saw some of them dragging a man from block number five, trying to lift him up and carrying him to the hospital. The cry was coming from him. The suicide by Indubhushan Roy and Ullaskar's insanity led to the second general strike intermixed with hunger strike. The authorities resorted to repressive measures and imposed all kinds of punishments, but the political prisoners were dauntlessly determined. Ultimately, they conceded to some of their demands and some of the political prisoners were sent outside the jail for work. But the strike continued inside the jail. Nanda Gopal and Nani Gopal were transferred to Viper Jail. Nani Gopal started hunger strike in the jail. But though most of the prisoners gave up the strike and resumed their work, Nani Gopal of Chinsura continued to strike for 72 days and the strike came to an end on 6th December 1912. The political prisoners resorted to another strike in March 1914. Almost all of them struck work. The general strike was in full swing. Ultimately, the government of India took a final decision on the fate of the political prisoners in Andamans in April 1914 to repatriate the term convicts except one to the Indian jails. They were repatriated between May 1914 to September 1914 in separate jails quite away from their own provinces. The revolutionary activities again erupted in 1915 onwards, which were most powerful in intensity, serious in nature and larger in dimension. The gates of the cellular jail in the Andamans were reopened to imprison and punish the political prisoners. 
A large number of Ghadar heroes were convicted in Lahore conspiracy case 1916. Banaras conspiracy case 1916, Raja Bazar bomb case 1914, Barisal conspiracy case, Shibpur Dakoiti case, martial law prisoners. Some other patriots convicted and sentenced for political crimes were also transported to the cellular jail in Andamans during 1915-1921. These political prisoners were destined to receive the same savage treatment at the hands of the unrelenting David Barry. As a result of these tortures and sufferings, Bhan Singh, Pandit Ram Rakha, courted martyrdom in the cellular jail. The freedom fighters started agitation against the barbaric, inhuman behavior of the authorities. There were strikes and hunger strikes. There was strong protest in the entire country, and the government was forced to appoint a jail commission on whose recommendation the cellular jail was once again closed for the political prisoners. And in 1921, all the political prisoners, including Savarkar brothers, were repatriated to the jails in the mainland. In 1932, a large number of revolutionaries were convicted of looting the treasury near Kakori in UP, and a few of them were sentenced to transportation. On 18th April 1930, occurred the great outbreak in Chittagong, Bengal, known as the Chittagong Armory Raid. All these revolutionary activities compelled the British to reopen the cellular jail to receive revolutionaries. In later years, a number of revolutionaries, mostly from Bengal, were sentenced to transportation and deported to the cellular jail. The political prisoners rebelled against the inhuman condition prevailing in the cellular jail. Mass hunger strike was resorted to by them on 12th May 1933, but it was called off at the cost of three lives, Mahavir Singh, Mohit Moitra, and Mohan Kishore Namadas, who died as a result of brutal force-feeding process by the jail officials. time, इधर में हंगर स्ट्राइक हुआ अंदमान सेल्ड जेल में जो लोग था और इसका सपोर्ट में बांग्ला का जितना जेल था सब और डेटिन्यू सब को मिलाके ये दुनिया का सबसे ज्यादा आदमी का हंगर स्ट्राइक वही था उन्हें सच्चे चिरिशाल में तीन आदमी मर गए आरे मरने के बाद भी ऐसा उन लोग को बस्ता में घुसा के और पत्थर पत्थर देके समुद्र में फेंक दिया तो जो लोग फेंका है उससे कोई कोई तो देश का आदमी था वो वो लोग हम लोग को बोल दिया तब हम लोग को पता नहीं है यहाँ कौन मरा है कौन नहीं मरा the last strike was resorted to in the year 1937 and resulted in the repatriation of all the political prisoners from cellular jail to their respective states on mainland India. This strike was terminated on the intervention of Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore. And I came in 1935 January in Andaman and here the special incident was there is a hunger strike in the second, second hunger strike in 1937 for a repatriation and better treatment. And the leaders of the country had a great agitation. And the Fazlal government at the time took us back. And that was in January 1938. So 35 January and 30th, I was completely here three years. Shortly after the repatriation of political prisoners from Andaman in January 1938, the Second World War broke out, which reopened another chapter of atrocities on the people of Andamans, this time at the hands of the Japanese Imperial Force, who were in the occupation of Andaman and Nicobar Islands from 23rd March 1942 to 7th October 1945. 
They put to death many hundreds of people in the most barbaric way. Many of the educated persons, who were mostly the members of Indian Independence League branch at Port Blair, were rounded up as suspected spies of the British and were kept in the cellular jail. They were either shot dead by the Japanese or died due to prolonged tortures and sufferings at the hands of the Japanese occupants. The Humphrey Gung Martyrs Memorial today stands as a mute witness to the inhuman treatment meted out to the citizens of Andamans by the Japanese. Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, accompanied by members of the Azad Hind government and his staff, paid an official visit to Andaman Islands from 29th to 31st December 1943. He stayed at the former British Chief Commissioner's official residence on Ross Island. His visit followed the Japanese Prime Minister's historic declaration at the Assembly of Greater East Asiatic Nations in Tokyo on 6th November 1943, that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands would be transferred to the provisional government of Azad Hind. On 30th November, Netaji addressed a mass rally of Indians and formally hoisted the national tricolor. In the words of Netaji, like the Bastille in Paris, which was liberated first in the French Revolution, setting free political prisoners, the Andamans, where our patriots suffered, is the first to be liberated in India's fight for independence. The cellular jail was dedicated to the nation on 11th February 1979 by the then Prime Minister Sri Murarji Desai. The saga of this heroic struggle is now brought alive in a moving sonne lumiere, that is, the sound and light show that takes one back in time, outlining the agony and sufferings of those who crossed its threshold. अंडमान सही मानों में त्याग बलदान और संघर्ष की भूमि है और जो आजादी के दीवाने हैं या देशभक्त हैं उनके लिए एक महान तीर्थ है। Thus, once the ill-famed and notorious cellular jail is now a place of pilgrimage.